Hello everyone, I'm Glitch the Box Links, and today I've got another out of the box challenge. Legends Arceus is a game that deviates a bit from the normal Pokemon formula, introducing Agile and Strong Style to help deal as much damage as possible before the opponent can fight back. So I had a simple question, what if I couldn't deal damage directly? The rules are simple, I won't use battle items and I can only use status moves, meaning that physical or special moves that deal direct damage are off limits, but I can choose any Pokemon or status move that exists. So what? Status only runs have been done before, what makes this one difficult? Well, I'm glad you asked. Legends Arceus introduced new statuses and reworked some of the existing ones. Additionally, some status moves were turned into attacking moves, and others were removed completely, leaving only 29 left to choose from. Out of those 29, only 2 can inflict a status that deals damage, and only 7 evolution lines have access to those 2 moves. Furthermore, a lot of the Pokemon in the game don't even get access to 4 status moves and are limited to a single one, like Snorlax. So. With the rules set, let the adventure begin. We start with our choice of three Pokemon, Oshawott, Cyndaquil, and Rowlet. If you don't want to ditch your starter later, go with Rowlet. While the other two are great Pokemon, only Rowlet can access four status moves, and of the limited moves all three yet, Rowlet gets the best set. Once we confirm our choice, the game introduces us to the Galaxy Team, where the player is given a test to prove they're worthy of becoming a member. But before we can take the test, we already have a required fight. Volo shows up for the first time, and now all we need to do is... Oh, right. We don't start with any status moves. You see, at this point in the game, there's no way to level up or acquire a status move, and I tried quite a few ways to find a skill. Unfortunately, this fight is required, so you must complete it with attacking moves. If anyone finds a skip for this or an alternate solution, I would love to know. But for now, I'll not count this fight and ensure that this is the only exception to the rule. The test for becoming a Galaxy member entails catching three Pokemon. The first two catches are a breeze, and even though the Shinx requires you to enter battle, you can just throw a Pokeball on turn one and not click any moves. With my mission complete, I became a Galaxy member and got access to the most important mechanic of any game. Changing my drip. Ah, that feels better. Now time to start the actual run. The start of the run is quite repetitive, honestly. Load up on as many materials as you can and try to raise your star rating. Besides that general goal, you want to start catching Pokemon that can learn status moves. While there isn't a correct answer, Wormpool will be a great starting choice. Dustox gets access to Poison Powder, and that's our real first way to take opponents down. Another really useful catch is Drifloon, as it's decently bulky when evolved and has decent resist. One suggestion I would make at this stage in the game is also to catch some EVs and start raising them. Umbreon and Vaporeon are quite bulky and provide good typings while also having access to at least 4 status moves. After a bit of grinding, my first star was earned, and the commander rewards a few recipes for the trouble. Before you're allowed to exit the village again, your rival demands a fight and won't let you leave until you do. As long as you've got a Pokemon that knows Poison Powder like Dustox, the fight itself is pretty easy. I had a Shinx, Starly, Weasel, Rowlet, Drifloom, and Dustox. One thing to note, though, that's unique to Hisui is that unlike other games, Poison doesn't stay until the Pokemon goes down. If you want to KO an enemy with it, you'll need to apply it multiple times, but most go down with two or three repeated poisonings. When Ray goes down, the game unlocks the training grounds. I noted that the status moves are limited, but even worse, some are locked behind various star ratings and can only be learned by the training grounds. For now, Rust is unlocked and will be of great value on every Pokemon that can learn it across the whole run. Allowing your Pokemon to heal at the cost of becoming drowsy is an acceptable substitute for the battle items that are off-limits. With my first battle won, I gained some confidence and moved on to Mai, who also went down just as easily. Winning this fight unlocks another section to explore where we can find new Pokemon and better experience by catching them. In general, I mostly leveled by catching wild Pokemon as fighting them took significantly longer. Another note before getting too far into the run, depending on your planned team, it might be worth picking up satchels to gain merit points. These give you the ability to buy evolution items to evolve certain helpful Pokemon, but for my team choices, I only needed one item from these points. After spending some more time grinding out Star Rating 2, I started attempting the Alpha Cricketune fight, and actually struggled here. It could deal a lot of damage, and my team just simply wasn't strong enough. I evolved Rowlet, swapped up my team a bit, and spent some time grinding up levels. The strategy stayed the same, just apply poison and switch out to a bulk of Pokemon while it takes damage, but the extra grinding really helped deal with this fight. With Cricketune dealt with, the game tasks us with the beginning of the main plot, taking down Nobles. One thing I'd recommend before continuing with the battle before the Noble is to catch some Alphas and grind a bit more. This run is very grind-heavy, but the battles will not be forgiving if you're under level. Leon guards the Noble Cleavor, and his team consists of a single Gumi. He's one of the easiest fights on the run, and easily mulled through with a couple of Poison Powders. 
take her down and head back to town to learn the plan on how to deal with Cleavor and unlock Weird Ear. There's one last battle before we can take on Cleavor, which is Irida. She has a Glaceon that is slightly higher level than the Gumi we just fought, but still goes down without any real strategy. Set up Poison and watch the HP bar slowly drop to zero. If you've played the game, you'll know that the Noble's fights don't really require us to directly battle them. Instead, your character throws bombs and dodges their attacks until the fight is won. While you can send in Pokemon to do battle, it's not required and only makes this run harder if you do. This challenge doesn't really change these fights, so I won't really show them or any strategy for them. Back into the village, we get more plot and unlock the next area. But before we're allowed to go there, Ray wants to fight once again. This one was definitely harder than previous encounters and I had saved in the village, meaning I couldn't go and grind up levels before fighting him. Luckily, I had caught quite a few Pokemon in order to rank up my star rating. If you release them from the pastures, they'll drop grid items. These can be used to increase any of your Pokemon's six various stats. Generally, there's no reason to raise attack or special attack in this run, minus one exception I'll get to later. Additionally, I wouldn't recommend ranking up your speed stat, as it'll make later fights harder. Instead, focus on HP, defense, and special defense. Before completing the Cleavor event, I had managed to catch an Alpha Parasect and a high-level Driplim, both of which turned out to be quite useful in this fight and most of the early game. With increased stat points, I jumped back in. The basic strategy I started using here and continued for most of the run was to set Poison with a Pokemon like Dustox, then swap to something tanky allowing them to stall while Poison would chip away at opponent's health. The bulky Pokemon would have moves that could heal them, bulk up their defense, or drop an opponent's attack stat to help stay alive longer. When Poison wore off, or the next Pokemon came out, I'd swap back in for a short period and reset Poison, rinsing and repeating until the trainer is finally defeated. Now that the next area is accessible, I would highly advise catching a Gengar, or anything from its evolution line. It can learn Poison Gas, and having the Ghost Typing made it a decent matchup for various battles. Additionally, I evolved my Eevee into Umbreon, and if you're doing this run, I strongly advise you to get an Umbreon, as it proved invaluable across the rest of the run. With the team improvements made, I progressed the story and found myself fighting Volo once again. In this fight, he's only got two Pokemon and both are unevolved, so they went down fairly easy with my so far tried and true tactic. Following the Volo fight, we meet the bandits, and beyond being trouble in the story, they are a problem to my run. Coin challenges to a battle and leads with Toxicroak. Up to this point, I've been relying on poison, but there are two types you can't poison. Other poison types like Toxicroak and Steel types. You might think to yourself, hey, Moves like Will-O-Wisp or Leech Seed can work here, and you'd be right, except for one major detail. Those don't exist in Legends Arceus. In the beginning of the run, I said that only two moves can inflict a Stadius that deals damage, Poison Powder and Poison Gash, which are completely ineffective for both Poison and Steel types. So what now? How do we beat Coin? Well, if you're not familiar with Pokemon, every move has a certain amount of times it can be used called Power Points. Once your Pokemon runs out of power points with all of its moves, it's forced to struggle and take 25% of its health and recoil. Fast forward through way too many turns and Coin's Toxicroak struggles itself till it faints. With Coin out of the way, the next parts of the story go by fast. Ursaluna falls to poison and Noble No. 2 Litigant goes down with ease. The Cobalt Coastland starts out with us fighting Irida, and wait, is that two Pokemon? Well. Even if we can only use one, they still poison the same, and the Drift Limb I caught earlier improves more than bulky enough to tank the Glaceon while Eevee can't touch it. After the fight, I picked up another Satchel and was able to buy a Linking Cord to evolve Haunter into Gengar, who would be placed on my team for the rest of the run. Continue forward with some dialogue and a required catch. If you're lower level at this point, there's an Alpha Chansey near the Duskull area that provides pretty good experience to farm for leveling up. Unlock Basque Legion and go try to save the Growlithe from the bandits. And I say try because this fight really sucked. You have to do three battles in a row without healing or using battle items. Two of the trainers have a poison type Pokemon and all of their Pokemon do quite a lot of damage. This was my first rogue blocker and I spent a lot of time grinding and retrying this fight. Once again I rebuilt my team and this would be the final change I made. For the rest of the run, I used Dustox, Driftblim, Decidueye, Gudra, Umbreon, and Gengar. And while it made a solid team for my run, I'd highly suggest swapping Decidueye for something bulkier and trading Dustox for a Magmortar. After a substantial amount of leveling, I went back in with my Pokemon mostly being level 48, and while that was over 10 levels higher than the Bandits, I still had trouble. Clover goes down easily enough, only having an Abomasnow. Easily poisoned and easily stalled. Coin fights next and once again brings out Toxicroak. It's quite a pain to stall out this time as its moveset is Poison Jab, Mud Bomb, and Rock Smash, and none of my Pokemon resisted all three. 
Luckily, Rest and Calm Mine are still in this game, and the extra defense and self-healing proved enough to endure all the way through until it struggled itself out. The final battle of the sequence is Charm, who, unlike the others, has two Pokémon. Number one is Rhydon, and has moves that are super effective against both Dustox and Gengar. I set Poison up and Dustox went down. Gengar was still in the back, but Rhydon wound up being one of the only, if not the only Pokémon in the whole run I didn't need to poison twice. With the Stone Rhino out of the way, Gengar is the last Pokémon to deal with. Really, the only strat here is to try to survive. Both Sligu and Umbreon were decently bulky versus Gengar, and after quite a large number of turns, the Goose Pokémon faded away into its Pokéball, letting him capture this victory. With the bandits out of the way, the Growlithe evolves, revealing Arcanine as the third noble which I took down using normal means. After a large serving of Potato Mochi, Kamado congratulates us, and the Lordless Island mission completes. My least favorite character then interrupts, and when Melee's discontent for us, Adamant challenges us to prove our worth. After the bandits fight, he was a breeze. As long as the Pokémon on your team that can inflict poison don't go down, or you miss a large number of times like me, this fight should be quite straightforward and easily won. The next area is the Coronet Highlands, where Melly gets upset that I won't battle him and sabotages the lights in the cave ahead. Luckily, Ingo is a solid friend and helps us through the tunnel. On the other side, we get stopped by Melly again, and this time he refuses to let me by until I battle. As if he wasn't annoying enough, he had to have a Pokémon that's poison type. So I waste 10 minutes of my time stalling him out until the Skun Tank finally struggles its HP to zero. Shortly after, Ingo wants to fight too. You know, it seems like everyone just wants to battle us. Luckily, Ingo doesn't provide a challenge as his whole team can be poisoned, and after enough turns, they all go down. As with the other areas, this one has a noble too, and the story events lead us up the cliffs to the next one where Melly is being annoying and blocks our way again, wanting a rematch and remaining salty about our last battle. In line with his character, he pulls out three Pokémon that are poison and really annoying to deal with. Luckily, unlike the bandits battle, we don't need to stall each one individually since they all attack us each turn. The first one to run out of power points is Skuntank, which is the strongest, and once it goes down, the Zubat and Scoryupi can be stalled out pretty easily. With Melly down, Electrode is accessible, and I clear out Noble number 4. At this point, I was proceeding pretty easily through the story and didn't really have any notable fights for a bit. The Alabaster Wasteland fights are all quite easy with the team I had set up. The basic strategy of setting poison and swapping to a bulky Pokémon continued to carry me through the whole area without any issue. The next story hook has you getting expelled from the village and chasing down the Red Chain, and while you might think that some of the required fights like the Alpha Gudra would be difficult, they can all just be caught without actually trying to fight. Once you retrieve the Red Chain, you begin the final series of events in the main game and trek up to Mount Coronet, where the easy section of the run would be over. Kamado has lost it, and we are tasked with stopping him. But before we can reach Kamado, Benny reveals that he is actually quite the trainer and issues a challenge before we can pass. On paper, Benny doesn't look that hard. Four Pokémon and one immune to poison. Nothing we haven't already seen in this run. However, those four Pokémon are all quite strong and have a lot of moves that most of my team is weak to. In other words, most of his Pokémon have at least one move that is super effective versus most of my team. Even with a good strategy, I knew I'd need some more levels, so I set off to level up a bit after getting destroyed. Back in the first area in the game, there's actually an Alpha Blissey that can be fought or caught for XP, and has a decent chance of dropping an XP candy. If you're looking to level up at any point during this run, and can't find a Pokémon that yields good experience, this one certainly does, but might be a bit difficult early on in the run. With some newfound strength, I stomp back into the fight with Benny. His first Pokémon is Miss Magius. After setting up Poison, I swap back to Umbreon to stall it since it had the best resistance to it versus the rest of my team. After setting Poison three times, Miss Magius finally went down and Gardevoir swapped in. One downside to using Rest is that it leaves our Pokémon drowsy, so when I needed my turn the most, Drowsy stopped me from taking a move and I lost Dustox due to it, leaving only one Poison Setter left. Gengar isn't particularly a great matchup versus Gardevoir due to being weak to Psychic, but I got lucky and Benny opted for Calm Mind instead of attacking. Gudra made a pretty good staller for Gardevoir, but this game really doesn't like players that try to play status only, so Poison wore off and Gengar had to swap back in. Due to Gengar having quite a high speed stat, I got Poison back up, but unfortunately he went down, leaving me to deal with the last two Pokémon without being able to set Poison. In earlier fights, I had stalled out Pokémon that weren't susceptible to poison, and that was certainly the strat I adopted once both Gengar and Dustox went down. 
I won't show the whole stall fight, but something I learned here is that if a Pokemon runs out of moves that can deal damage to the Pokemon who's on your side of the field, the opponent will swap out even if they had other moves left with points. After that realization and some help from online guides telling me which moves his Pokemon had, I was able to stall out the Glade and Sneasler with less risk, letting me claim victory and get the Mochi Chef back on our side. Up at the top of the summit, Kamado awaits and believes he can actually beat me. After the fight with Binny, he honestly proved to be not that difficult. All four of his Pokemon could be poisoned, and while they could deal a decent amount of damage, I had already leveled up quite a bit and took him down after only one retry. There's not a particular strategy that helps here, just poison and swap back as usual trying to preserve your HP where you can. Once Kamado is down, we finish our climb to the top and Dialga appears. You might ask why I sided with Adamant instead of Irida since Dialga resists poison. Well, that's because I never intended to actually try this fight. Instead, just chuck a bunch of Ultra Balls till you catch it, and meanwhile, keeping your Pokemon healed up with rest. In my case, it took around 6 Ultra Balls, and that's the fight. With Dialga captured, we start the final events, which lead up to a Noble fight with Palkia. There's only one fight before the Noble, which, compared to Biddy and Kamado, kind of a pushover here. Rhydon goes down to Poison, and Gengar is an easy stall with Umbreon. It's honestly a bit weird of a fit after Kamado, because it's significantly easier. And that's kind of the run? The final battle doesn't require fighting, and honestly the climax was a bit disappointing. So, with the point proven that you can beat the base game, I decided to add to my initial goal and try to make it through the post-story main quest as well. I hadn't played these before starting this run and thought they would be much more substantial, but mostly they consist of you catching legendaries, which I pretty much caught all of them with a single Ultra Ball, finding plates, and taking down a stray alpha or two. There is a rematch with Kamado though, and this one was quite difficult. He has an extra Pokemon, better movesets, and is higher level than the previous fight. Ultimately though, I just leveled up a couple of times on the Alpha Blizzy and then poisoned his whole team until he told me his story. So why even mention I did the post game if there's no interesting fights? Well, that's because there is one interesting one. When you've essentially completed post game, you build up to a fight with Volo, who reveals themselves as a sort of final villain. If you're following this run on your own, stop and save yourself from the following pain. If you are trying to follow and refuse to stop, then do yourself a favor and spend many hours grinding up to level 100 with your entire team. It'll save you tremendous amounts of pain and wind up being less time than I spent to clear this fight. I did not grind up to level 100 however, and after retrying multiple times and wasting at least 10 hours, I brought my whole team into the high level 80s and my Dustox and Gengar reached 91. Even out leveling Volo by 20 levels, I still struggled and required an hour to an hour and a half for every attempt of this fight. See, this fight is quite unique in the game. Volo has a full team of six Pokemon, and two of them have to be stalled out since they can't be poisoned. Additionally, once you get through the first phase, you fight Volo in a second phase with Giratina, and then again with a third phase with Giratina's origin form. What's so hard about a single Giratina, you might say? You can poison it, right? Well, sure, but that's not the hard part. You see, since I restricted the usage of battle items, we have to do all three battles without healing or restoring any power points. For Volo, the strategy is survive. No, literally. I would tell you to try to poison all four Pokemon that can be, but in doing so I continually lost my poison setters. If you lose your poison setters during this battle, good luck having enough power points to stall out the next two phases. I didn't say this at the beginning, but I also restricted myself from using struggle, meaning I couldn't run out of power points. During my successful attempt, I managed to take down the Spiritomb and Arcanine with poison, but needed to stall all the other Pokemon Volo has. Well, I was sort of able to poison the Garchomp too, but due to its movesets, I needed to almost completely stall out on moves before I could safely set up poison. Generally, you want to try to stall out each of Volo's Pokemon with whoever will take the least damage from them. However, in some cases, you can get into scenarios where they actually can't deal damage to you due to a Pokemon being immune to one or some of the moves they have. Technically, you could poison the Togekiss, but I wound up avoiding it. Every time I tried to poison it, it would KO one of my poison setters, and it would cause me to lose at a later part of this battle. Do not take any chances, and be very patient, making sure that you have rest and roost on almost every Pokemon on your team. I also recommend Calm Mind, Shelter, and similar moves that boost your defenses as losing a Pokemon will severely hurt your chances of a successful attempt at this battle. One last note I'll make about this first phase is with the evolutions. All of them get access to baby doll eyes, and I carried it on my Umbreon. It reduces your opponent's attack power, and it was extremely helpful in this fight. Essentially, I would lower a Pokemon's attack power before swapping, and it helped give me a chance to heal or set poison on various Pokemon on this team. Just to add one more thing to the difficulty of this, 
the majority of Pokemon that get healing moves only get access to rest. When you rest to heal, you become drowsy and have a chance of losing multiple turns in a row which can end an attempt immediately depending on who goes down. After several attempts and literally an hour of stalling through his Pokemon and meticulously managing how many power points I had left on every Pokemon, I made it through Phase 1 without losing any of my team. Phase 2 is Giratina, right? We just poisoned it and call it victory. Well, that's not correct. If you look at the footage of a regular Pokemon losing HP from poison, and then Giratina, you'll notice it only takes half the normal damage of poison. This means I'll need to set it up an extra time or two per phase, and stall twice as long as any normal Pokemon to take it down. If you made it to this phase without enough poison moves left, or enough moves on your other Pokemon to endure the extra turns, then congratulations, you get to restart the entire sequence and start from the very beginning with the hour-long Volo fight. Even on my best attempt, I still lost one of my two poison setting Pokemon on the last phase, and was left with only three at the end with almost no power points. The good news is that now that I've cleared this fight, that's it. The main quest would have you go catch all the Pokemon and have another Noble Showdown with Arceus, but those are not unique in this run and you can do them as normal. So, with this run over, I can finally stop being such a toxic trainer and go back to battling normally. If you enjoyed this challenge and like Pokemon runs, consider dropping a like and following as there are some ridiculously difficult runs coming to this channel in the future and one that has been over a year in the making. If you want to see these runs live, consider checking out my Twitch where I stream all my runs before we know if they're even possible. I'm Glitch the Box Links, and I'll see you in the next Out of the Box Challenge.